Hello and a warm welcome to Citizens' Corner Debate, a joint initiative by Euronet Plus and the Bulgarian National Radio. I am Nikola Melodinov and today's topic with or without Schengen. The borderless uh, internal EU area is under huge pressure because of migrants fleeing to Europe. The terror attacks in Brussels recently in Paris in November also put in doubt the Schengen area's principle and even ex its existence. So uh, although the announced closure of the so-called Western Balkans route and the refugee deal with Turkey, as of today, seven Schengen countries still unilaterally impose land border controls. These are Germany, Austria, France, Belgium, Denmark, Sweden and Norway. What can the European Parliament, the European Commission, the institutions can do to improve the Schengen functioning? Uh, and uh, what would be the effects and the costs of the collapse of Schengen? These and more questions I will discuss now with uh, my guests today. Mr. Timothy Kirkhope, uh, member of the European Parliament from the United Kingdom, European Conservative and Reformist Group, member of the Committee of Civil, Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, very important committee. Uh, Victor Negrescu, a member of the Parliament from Romania, Group of Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, member of the Committee of Budgets, Mr. Andrei Kovacev, uh, he is a Bulgarian MAP from uh, member of the Committee of Foreign Affairs, Monsieur uh, Laurent Michel, Director General uh, of uh, Directorate C, Migration and Protection, GG Home from the European Commission, and uh, Mr. Luc Jaillet, uh, President of the Various Interest Group from the European Economic and Social Committee, and Corina Glicuta. She is a student from the University of Cluj. Welcome to all. And uh, probably let's start with the representative of the European Commission, because the Commission has warned for billions of euros of losses in case uh, um, of long-term Schengen disruption of the border checks. Most governments, however, uh, have concerns about their security because of massive unregistered groups of people uh, entering without any papers uh, through the border. So is there really such a dilemma now between national security and uh, movement in the Schengen area? Well, not at all. I think that the Commission, in its communication of March called Back to Schengen, has expressed its views clearly that measures to protect the citizen, EU citizen, are uh, in line with the Schengen Code. You can reinstall border controls when you have a risk at your security or that when you are facing massive migratory flows. What we are expecting is that the member states are acting together in a consistent and coherent manner. So we want to avoid that one member state starts to establish border controls, internal border controls, and then it has a domino impact, domino effect. We try to organize it in a more coordinated manner. I will give the floor to Mr. Andrei Kovacev because, uh, as, I, as I understood, he has to leave us uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, so go ahead, Mr. Kovacev. Where is the problem now between the security and the freedom of movement? Can, can the EU package presented by the Commission can solve really this, uh, with, along with the European Parliament, of course? European Parliament, but also very important, uh, the voice of the member states, of the government of the European Union, uh, they need to find a common solution on the, uh, this really dramatical challenge what we are facing now all, uh, of the continent. And uh, indeed, from one side, the uh, European Union uh, economy is so used with the common market, with the free borders, that uh, there was very difficult to even calculate what it means for a long term to introduce again uh, the uh, internal borders, uh, the different uh, calculations, how many uh, billions or even trillion of euro could uh, uh, cost uh, this uh, introduction. But the balance between security and a free movement of people, of, uh, of uh, goods, uh, is uh, something uh, what need to define the future uh, common solution. And I'm for a um, very big change in the Dublin um, regulation. Uh, because until now the Dublin was uh, made for good times. Now we are facing bad times, so, so called it, uh, if you like, force majeure times, where um, Dublin simply, as it is now, is not functioning. And this uh, short uh, or, um, emergency measure, what was introduced, I think is even not enough. For a new Dublin, we need 
a totally new setup of how uh, in a shared responsibility we are from one side uh, protecting our external border, keeping uh, internal border open and distributing the uh, last of the, this, uh, this uh, migrants or refugees, if they are refugees, uh, from one side dealing with the refugees, from other side uh, dealing with migrants. This is two different cases, which uh, many times is uh, uh, misconfused uh, or mixed. And very important issue, populism in Europe. This situation uh, gives a lot of food for different populists in different member in, in almost every member state of the European Union to misuse the legitimate uh, the, le the legitimate uh, threats of uh, for the citizens or the affairs of the citizens which uh, are uh, now um, facing uh, on uh, social security on uh, physical security after the terrorist attacks especially in Paris in in, in Brussels uh, if we are not uh, fast enough uh, to provide uh, uh, this new setup of uh, border controls or uh, security exchange and this is a scandal that our uh, intelligence services are not this uh, not uh, disseminating and not uh, um, exchanging information on uh, fight against terrorism uh, Europol need to be the point for the moment where the databases need to be fit from uh, the different uh, intelligence services of the member states, uh, which uh, we know that is not the case, and I think it's a scandal, but uh, this is uh, something related to the uh, trust between our uh, security services. So then, um, a shared, complex solution, what we need, and uh, uh, fast. This uh, is uh, very important. This uh, about the populism was very good. Uh, I have to uh, remind you that you can follow us uh, with your questions via Facebook event under the Euronet Plus Citizens Corner debate, as well as using the Twitter hashtag Citizens Corner EU. And Mr. Kirkhope, uh, here's one to you uh, from our Facebook follower, Annika. Uh, what is the best thing to do, giving money to Turkey or to Greece to protect our common borders? Uh, well, I, I've been thrown straight into the deep end on this and not able to make any uh, preliminary statement. I just want to, I will answer that question. Let me just say, though, that I think that um, any criticism, I'm, I'm personally in favour of a very reduced uh, change to Dublin. Um, I think Dublin has the right principles, but they just haven't been adhered to. Um, I, think, I think also on Schengen, we ought to remember that Schengen is not just a question about physical borders, um, wire and all the rest of it. <clears throat> Schengen is there for a much wider reason to try and support this uh, freedom, this freedom of movement of goods, services and people. Uh, my own country is not subscribed to Schengen, as we all know, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to see as much freedom in that movement as possible. And I would not join my colleague over there in criticizing the intelligence services. Uh, my PNR report has just gone through the parliament with a big majority last week, which is going to actually f oblige the intelligence agencies all over Europe now to talk to each other much more. And uh, I shall be involved, I think, in a number of other ways of doing that. Um, but I think that this sort of question about Greece specifically and uh, Turkey, uh, I mean, I have expressed my own concerns about the agreement with Turkey. I'm not particularly keen on some of the details of that, to be frank with you. And uh, I always cry, uh, called out that we should actually be helping our frontline states. As long as we do have a Dublin, which is roughly as it is, we need to be helping the frontline states much more, taking responsibility with them for their obligations to... Uh, process people who actually arrive at the EU. So if, if, if I'm being asked or forced here to make a decision or to make a, a, a comment, either more, more for Turkey or more for Greece, I don't think it was quite like that. But I would say I would prefer very much to put more resources into helping the Greeks um, and not risking so much money um, on the particular agreement that we have in place at the moment with Turkey. Mr. Jair, uh which are your concerns at the European Economic and Social Committee uh, when we talk about uh, Schengen future? But when we talk about Schengen future, first of all, we are very afraid that we are, with the rushing of national and ad hoc measure taken on the urgency, destroying one of the most performative success. That is a partial success because we have to remember that we have not applied entirely 
the Article 77 of the Treaty on the Functioning that was allowing the freedom of movement inside the European Union, inside the member of the Schengen area, but was also obliging to build up a common management of the external border, what has not been done. So we have to deliver what has not been done until now. And exactly, I, I have to compliment the Parliament and you as rapporteur with the PNR, because I have, have understood many of the of the treatment of the people that was treated about this uh, uh, delivering our personal data on travel to our secret uh, services. I was laughing because we are delivering every day with our smartphone to Google, to the private company, all our data, on, not only on the travel, because all the tickets are online on Google Calendar and so on, but everything, and we are not treated by passing, but we are treated for passing to the security service, that is true that in some country, and also in mind the past has many something not so clear, but they are obliged to come to report to the parliament and to the government. So we sometimes we have very incredible debate as we have not accepted to increase the cooperation after the, the attack in Paris one year ago because my government has proposed some full entire and transparent cooperation to other government has been refused, the necessity to build up a joint FBI or more, more obliged uh, uh, cooperation between the, between, within the forces. But you have also to, to be consistent to, to the others. Today, we are taking uh, one of the major challenges to, to us, to the society, to our political perspective in, uh, as, as an urgency. The question of the refugees is not an urgency. It's a structural problem that will be will be even growing in the next year. Today we are focusing on the refugees coming from a war, from Syria. But the situation of Syria was clear three years ago. There are 10 million people displaced in Syria due to the war. Not for one moment for an earthquake. Four of these 10 million are out South Syria. 47% of these people are in Turkey. Do you think they will stay forever in this place where we have stopped two years ago to contribute to UNHCR and the other agency for maintaining the, the, the refugees camp? There was a clear alarm one year ago by the international organization. They have finished, handed the money to... to, to. So we have to help either the country where these people are close to the situation of crisis, either the, the country where they are entering, and they will continue to enter. And just a, a, a last sentence about uh, the question of the border, because as Italy we are very concerned from both sides, from one side now that we have... The Brenner's Pass. Huh? The Brenner's Pass. The Brenner's Pass, but they also from the west uh, part of Italy, Torino, and we have a, a remember when there was the border between Italy and France. We do not have to complain the smugglers in the Mediterranean. We have the smugglers in Piemonte that were organized the traffic of human beings through the mountains in France. So we can close the, the, the Brenner Pass very easily. What will be stopped will be the commerce, the trade, the normal people, the other will go with new smugglers through the mountains. And it was done in the past. That's the tragedy. We are responding to clear problem with a bad answer that not only on the moment the populists are only a political calm but are not solving real the problem. And that's a disaster for everyone. Let's go a bit uh, to the east with uh, Mr. Viktor Negresco from uh, the Romanian Socialists. Uh, how in your country uh, the Schengen domino effect uh, was perceived? I personally believe that uh, Schengen is not in a crisis. Uh, our faith in Schengen is actually in a crisis currently. Uh, and uh, this is due to also to the rhetoric uh, of the populist movement that uh, only criticize Schengen but do not deliver any, any solutions. Uh, like uh, the other MEPs, I also believe that uh, uh, borders will not resolve the issue. Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia have borders and they couldn't protect themselves from the movement of the refugees. So the question is how we can work together in order to protect our borders. And the solution is to talk about an European security, not about national security, because at the end it's about everyone and it's about the security of all Europeans. And also I will not oppose Europe to freedom of movement because both have to work together. And I can, and I can say something uh, in relation to that. Just when the refugee crisis started to, to become very, very public, I worked with some of my colleagues in Romania and I raised uh, signatures for the integration of Romania in Schengen. And in two weeks' time, we raised more than 30,000 signatures, which shows that you know, Romanians and maybe other Europeans are truly supportive of, of Schengen as a whole. 
we, my country is not in Schengen today. Uh, and uh, I believe that my country should be, uh, even in the current context. And I really believe Romanians are always, all, also supportive of that. We don't have a security problem. Our borders are very secure. And I think our borders can be very secure also in the Schengen area. But in order to do so, I underline again this idea of security exchange. It was clear also uh, during the last uh, attacks here in Brussels that we have a problem across Europe in exchanging information, in working together. We don't have biometric IDs everywhere. So we have difficulties in, in, in actually protecting ourselves within Europe, within Schengen, and borders will not resolve problems. It's like if we introduce borders between regions, if we introduce borders between countries, people will always find solutions to, to pass over them. So I really think that there are more benefits in being in Schengen than being outside Schengen, and we have to invest in protecting our external borders. And because I'm in the budget uh, committee, I have to underline that I really believe that we have the money for it. You know, we promise money for Turkey, we promise money for Greece, but what is the problem behind all of that is that we have in the budget the specific lines for that. We have the money to, to invest, but member states, some member states do not deliver. We didn't have enough money to deliver what we promised for the humanitarian aid for the Syrian refugees in Turkey and in the other countries in the region. So our problem here in Europe is to be uh, faithful to our promises. If we do that, we can protect our borders and we can help the refugees from those conflict areas. Let's hear the younger generation's uh, question today. Uh, Corina, what do you like to ask about Schengen? Uh, well, um, migration, migration influx is one of the biggest challenges uh, Schengen members have to deal with. So uh, considering the immigration crisis in Europe right now and the fact that Romania and also Bulgaria uh, are not in Schengen area, in your opinion, all of you guys, uh, do you consider this as being an advantage right now or not for both countries? I mean, it's an advantage not being in Schengen area or not for Romania and Bulgaria. Monsieur uh, Michel. Thank you. Well, I think there is a big interest for Bulgaria and Romania to, to join Schengen from an economic point of view. Um, your question is related to the migratory flows. If the migratory flows will divert to Romania and Bulgaria, I don't think so. I mean, the easiest route was Greece to the Western Balkan. Now we are dealing with it. It's true that the pressure might increase in Romania and Bulgaria because people, when they see a, a route which is closed, they will try to find another one. That's why the central made route to, towards Italy, from Libya to Italy, will increase. But whether you are in Schengen or not, you will face the pressure. So I think there is an interest for Romania and Bulgaria to join Schengen. The European Commission has always supported that process. As you know, you need unanimity in the Council for that, and it has been blocked by a number of member states, and that's a reality. But uh, for me, there's a clear interest, uh, despite uh, the migratory pressure to, to go for it. Just one point on Dublin, because Dublin was raised. I mean, Dublin was not created for such a situation. When Greece is facing more than 800,000 arrival in one year in the Greek islands, it's not possible to manage with the current Dublin system. There, was, there is not a single member state who could cope such number uh, with this, uh, the current Dublin system. That's why we need to reform Dublin, and that's why the Commission is proposing some options to reform Dublin. Thank you. Mr. Kirkhope, what do you think about uh, the advantages or disadvantages, uh, given the fact that the UK is out of Schengen, obviously? Uh, yeah, I mean, UK is out of Schengen for a whole lot of reasons, actually. But, I mean, one of them is obviously a geographical reason. Uh, another one is a historic reason. The third one, of course, is the is the whole political issue within the UK in terms of border control. Um, I, I was a minister for border controls in the 90s in the UK, um, and uh, you know, controlling immigration and that sort of thing is quite a critical issue in the UK. I know it is everywhere else too, but it certainly has been traditionally in the UK one of the major ingredients of the political system. And therefore, I'm not sure whether there's an appropriateness about the UK joining Schengen in the future. I really don't know. Um, as for other countries being outside of it or in it, will it be better or worse for them? Uh, my, my own feeling about it really is this. It is a matter for them to decide, and that, I think, is the key point. While we talk about European solutions for everything, I think you've got to be careful, because on this one, when you talk about politicians who are elected nationally, they are looking at national interests, and uh, immigration and borders are obviously a matter of some 
interest and where they have been able to open their borders and be fully part of Schengen, um, the countries involved, um, that takes its toll in political terms as well if, in fact, they suddenly get large influxes of people. But I just want to say finally on this thing about Schengen, if I may, Schengen has not been a failure. Um, I'm one of those that's very clear in my mind about this. In fact, the flexibility is built into Schengen to allow uh, borders to be reintroduced uh, in times of emergency or difficulty. In a way, that has actually not disproved the uh, Schengen. It has actually um, backed up the fact that Schengen has that flexibility and that uh, approach. And I think that, um, you know, so therefore I would not criticize, I'm not going to criticize Schengen too much as such, uh, but certainly as far as whether to join it or not in the case of Romania and Bulgaria, um, that I think is going to have more to do, not so much with the fact that extra pressures or less pressures through their borders. I don't think that necessarily is borne out, as our friend from the Commission says. I think that it is actually um, still, though, a matter for their own national politicians, and it may well be that they prefer uh, to keep those borders, even if the effect of those borders is not going to be that dramatic. Uh, okay, Mr. Jayer, um, your point of view, uh, enlargement of Schengen in this particular sensitive moment of reform, of migration? I think that the uh, on the table, there is not the issue of the reform of the Schengen. Hmm? It's clear. If there is an issue on the table, is exactly to use completely all what is established in the Schengen provision and also to do what has not been done until now. Because I fully agree, it's not a matter of questioning or criticizing Schengen. It's a matter of questioning two things. First, the fact that we have not fully applied what Schengen as, uh, because there was a time, a time of peace, so, okay, we leave the control of the external border to the state that are at the external border. We do not take, as a European matters, the external border of European Union. It's what we have not done. So we have not built a, pol a policy. Yes, we have trusted, and that's good, the, the single national security force. That's absolutely good. We cannot build up, but we have not built something consistent. And so, okay, the migrants are flowing to Spain, is a problem of Spain. The migrant flowing in the in the canal of Sicily is a problem of Italy. Uh, so now it's Greece. It will be another, that's not the way of managing this following the treaties. The pro the major problem is so I think that the state that want to enter, they should have the bit in a, put in the position of entering as soon as possible, as they are fulfilling the criteria that all the other states are, are, are fulfilling. So it's a question of a national evaluation for, for respect of different positions, history, history and, uh, and, and, and so on. But uh, uh, a second issue is uh, that we are not to think, uh, I am really convinced that we, uh, we are doing a major mistake uh, in the refugees crisis, as we have done in the economic crisis, financial crisis, we are considering urgency by urgency. We are not considering the structural problem we are facing too. There is a, a point of urgency that is the war. Of course, in Syria there is a war. We are not recognized because we were expecting that some other would have solved the problem at our place, looking for Americans, thanks to the Russian that they make uh, some solution, waiting for the Kurds that were fighting at our place, and leaving. And imagine that 10 million persons moving for the destruction, there will be not a problem. And once a day, some of them will not have discovered, or some member states have not been pushed. Now there are the risk of Libya or the North, uh, uh, North Africa. So we have problems to face of stabilizing. But we have also problems that not only the war. From the international law, we are not allowed to speak about the refugees due to the climate change. But we know, since the debate and the figure discussing in Paris, there is a risk at least of 200 million of people that will be refugees or will be m moving to the climate. They will not come all to Europe. But this problem all around the world will become one of the major problems in the years to come. We have to be prepared to cope with this, uh, with this issue. And this is incredible that uh, part of the world that is the richest one 500 million people cannot cope with one, two, three, or four million of people entering in our countries. Look to, to Lebanon, look to Jordania, look to Turkey. The, 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 repo, the, the percentage of the people moving, staying there. So it's incredible that we are afraid, we are moving such a, such a fear. 
Fear is there, people have been reassured, but not with the bad solution, and building up a, a long-term strategy. Uh, just a tough, a tough one for Mr. Negresco, because he's, he's a budget committee member uh, from Giorgio Parnese. Italy has to control EU borders for everybody, uh, but only the Italian citizens has to pay for the patrols controlling the Italian border with Africa. Do you think it is fair? So first of all, I have to mention that uh, the European Union contributes to the security of our common borders. Of course, I cannot give you all the details, but we truly contribute. And we there are different discussions already at the level of the EU and also in the Budget Committee to, to supplement the funds for, for our common security. We are discussing about a common security forces to protect our borders, and some steps have been made towards that. So it is clear that my point of view is that we are have to talk about a common external border and protect it all together, because um, otherwise uh, the solution is not to build again new citadels. Citadels couldn't protect the people in, the, in those cities before, so we have, to, we have to work together at European level. We have to talk about European security uh, and not European interest or national interest. Uh, it's not about interest, it's about security, and security means more than that. It means, uh, means ba basically protecting our people. And I really believe that in the enlargement of Schengen will increase the confidence in Schengen and also in the EU because Schengen is, if we want it or not, related to the idea of the European Union, and we have to protect Schengen to protect again the image of the European Union. So, in my in my sense, in my view, I think uh, countries like Romania and Bulgaria have a lot to benefit if they manage to integrate the Schengen area, and also the members from the Schengen area have a lot to gain from us because we have to say uh, there have hasn't been. Uh, in the last uh, 26 years, any problems with our borders from R R Romanian borders or the Bulgarian borders. So maybe our experience could help in securing the common European external borders. I really would like to, to ask again, uh, uh, Mr. Michel from the European Commission, because it is a so complex thing with different policies in it, uh, which aim to go back to normal, the Schengen uh, uh, internal movement. So many people are really confused uh, about so many propositions by, by uh, Brussels. So can Tur Turkey refugee deal, EU naval Mediterranean mission, along with the permanent refugee distribution uh, system, reform of Dublin, uh, common go border guard agency, everything this, can this calm down the concerns of the many governments in order to end this temporarily border controls uh, and re-establish the normal functioning uh, of the area? And I would like afterwards Mr. Kirchhoff to, to also uh, join in. Uh, would you please uh, say, are you optimist about this uh, mm -hmm. whole package? Uh, first of all, on the last question, I think we have to, to explain to the people listening now that the European border guard, external border guard borders are controlled by the national authorities, but with the support of Europe. And for instance, in, a, in the Central Med, it was the Italian Navy which started with the operation called Mare Nostrum, and it has been replaced by a European operation co called Triton. And so we are engage in Italian waters to support the Italian authorities in search and rescue operation and in border controls. What we have proposed now, we, you have mentioned a number of measures that we have proposed, are part of a package. There's no uh, magical solution, one solution to, to, to solve the issue. But we need aim it to do it by the end of the year. I mean, the We need a comprehensive approach, and that means that we need European border guards, we need relocation to work. We need resettlement from mm -hmm. Turkey. It's a number of measures that needs to take place. And I'm confident that if we add all the measures, we'll have a significant impact. If you look at the flows now coming from, from Turkey to Greece, they have decreased tremendously. It was on average 2,000 uh, person arriving in the Greek islands per day. Now we are around 80 people arriving per day. So it, it already has an impact. But of course, as I said before, the flows might divert. So we have to, to do the same thing or similar things for the other routes. So it's a package of measures that we need to take and will have an impact. So I'm, I'm positive that if all the member states play the game, we can have a real impact and can solve, and can solve the crisis. Mr. Kirchhoff, will the governments will play the game? Uh, well, I think, I mean, a lot of governments are playing the game. I mean, this, this, this uh, 
this uh, contribution that is being made in the Mediterranean, for instance. I know we've got, uh, even though uh, Britain is not in the Schengen, uh, obviously we've got uh, we've got naval ships involved in this whole operation, helping out. Um, and I think, but I think what we've really got to think, we're talking here very much about uh, Schengen, our internal borders, and then the external border, which is very important, of course. But I think we have to look at the issues more of the migratory flows themselves and how we can actually stop those flows. Because um, we, uh, whatever you do, you either do encourage or discourage. It's an effect straight away from even small actions that you take. We have got, as is rightly said, conflicts on our doorstep, very close to Europe, and we have got to put in more effort to try and end those conflicts, or at the very least to try and make sure that conditions can come back, that people can actually then remain in their countries or in the, in the zones where they have lived. I've always had a problem with migrant issues because it seems to me that whilst we may well want to be humanitarian, uh, moving people to places where they have absolutely no cultural or any other connection, language, anything at all, just because we are discharging a responsibility of a humanitarian nature, seems to me to be important, but not, but not our priority. Our priority has to be to take away the reason, the cause why people want to move as they do. So, uh, uh, Mr. Jayer. I fully agree with the last sentence. Of course, when you are in an urgency, you have to deal with the urgency. That's for sure. You cannot uh, do other now with the flu, but the flu has stopped. But we have to start to rethink long term and globally. So I expect very much from the strategy, the revision of the strategy of the external uh, action and the security that uh, Ms. Mogherini is preparing, we have to, lo to look to the long term. We have perhaps to to prepare a sort of alliance with Africa and the Mediterranean to manage in the long term this, to face, to anticipate the crisis, to invest, to anticipate. The, 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 climate, the climate change is not something that will happen for an earthquake once a day. It is still evident. Is There are forecasts on this. There are scientists that are working. So we have to invest in anticipating the process. We have to invest. I, am, I fully agree that the, most of the people do not want to live too far from their country. They want to stay close and to come back as soon as possible. But we have to help them. If we abandon them, as we have done in the refugees camp, but we have listened to the to the witness of NGO or international organization working in the, in, in, in the Mario Gutierrez was saying it two years ago, a clear warning about the, the end of money for the international organization to deal with the cost with the investment in the camp. We have not listened. So uh, after this, people will leave. If you have looked to the the situation, the concrete re uh, report from the uh, television and so on, but you with your family would have continued to live in this situation. You would have invested to find the possibility to live and to move. So we have to help the situation, we have to anticipate, and we have to invest in the long term. Now we are obliged to face the urgency. But don't forget that the problem is much more structural, and we have to invest is in our interest for our security and also for creating good opportunity for growth and job for both parts. So this has to be a long-term approach that we have to come back as soon as possible. Thank you. Since we have a few minutes left, I will make another uh, short round with your final words, but uh, let, let's look at the coming weeks and, and months, uh, uh, the summer approaches. Uh, still, we have problems in Greece managing the Schengen criteria, according to the European Commission, there, there will be an assessment to uh, whether, whether the country can process uh, the, the flows of people. And uh, on the other hand, uh, Turkish president uh, uh, warned, has warned that uh, Mr. Erdogan that uh, if visa liberalization won't happen soon, it might be the end of the deal. Uh, so uh, are you confident that uh, the EU can jointly address the, the common challenges, given the fact that all of this legislation will be in force, at least not, not immediately, but uh, um, by the end of the year, let's say. So, and we still have a summer to come uh, with a risky, risky opportunities for, uh, for many people, including from the ref for the refugees, not only for the EU member states. So, uh, Mr. Michel. Well, I think that we have to respect both sides of the deal with Turkey. So the European 
have also to fulfill their their commitments, like the Turks have to fulfill their commitments. If we do that, we'll have a solution at least for this route, the Eastern Mediterranean route. Then on the Central Me Mediterranean route, we'll have to do what is necessary. We are stepping up our efforts also on the uh, SOFIA, the military operation. We are doing a number of actions, and I think it will have an impact. I think we can manage uh, the coming months. Thank you. Mr. Negresco. I think uh, Europe uh, is capable of uh, giving the right answers to the, the current situation. And I really believe, like I stated at the beginning, that EU has to keep up to its promises towards its partners, but also towards the refugees, because we said that we are going to help those people in the camps where they are now, and we are doing this effort. But I really believe that we are doing too many assessments and not acting enough. And in this sense, I would like to see the European Union acting faster and acting stronger and seeing all the member states working together to tackle this crisis. Mr. Kirk, hope it's your turn. Yes, I mean, I, I, I say I've, um, I've had quite a lot of doubts about the agreement with Turkey for a whole lot of reasons. Turkey has done an enormous amount and is doing an enormous amount. There is no question about that at all. Um, but uh, I think uh, the difficulty, the political difficulty, is that once you start setting down a whole lot of negotiating positions with Turkey, uh, such as the visa liberalization and indeed the urgency of that, and also the discussions regarding membership in due course of the European Union, things like that, the pressures are built up, and large sums of money also, um, which have to be properly accounted for and so on. When you get into that situation, and a number of countries are very unhappy, very unhappy about that, I know, a number of member states, I think, I think, it is very difficult to see that we can develop that as smoothly as the Commission hopes we could. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we have to be very careful with this, this, because also it does create a precedent. It creates a certain precedent with possibly other countries too, who feel that their way into the European Union can be dealt with by deals and negotiations outside of the normal acquis which has always been, I think, the basis upon which member states can, you know, can join. So I, th I just think it's very difficult, this, and I'm not sure. I mean, I hope, I hope very much that Turkey will exercise its responsibilities and continue to do so, but I hope we don't end up with a sort of scramble in the middle of the year in which we are so desperate or so concerned that we start to sort of offer things which we cannot perform on because the member states simply won't accept it. All right, obviously, this is a topic which is uh, very difficult to be exhausted. Thank you all for your uh, participation. Really uh, appreciate your passion on this debate. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us. I hope to see you next time with Citizens Debate by Euronet Plus. <laughs>